Okay, so neurological um, assessment, neurological module. I don't know that I'm going to be able to keep this one under 30 minutes. There is lots and lots and lots of information. So um, we're going to, there are some parts of the book that I'm just going to let you read through, and I'm not going to go through them too in detail, but you are responsible for the entire chapter. So let's get started. All right, um, some differences in kids and adults. Um, the first couple of weeks gestation, really important. Anything that mom is exposed to, baby's exposed to. So that could affect normal CNS development. Um, at birth, their bones are developed, but they're not fused. You still have your sutures open, which is very important. There is one disease, pro or one um, condition called craniosynostosis, and we'll talk about that er uh, later on in the chapter. And that's when the sutures fuse too early, and that has to be surgically corrected. So those sutures are there for a reason. Uh, fontanelles, let's talk about fontanelles real quick. Uh, posterior and anterior fontanelles. So you need to know when they close. Um, because if you're doing an assessment, you're going to be assessing the fontanelles, and if they're closed prematurely or if they're open too long, then that could indicate something else is going on. Your posterior fontanelle, back of your head, um, closes first. It closes about two months. Um, by three months it should definitely be closed. Um, anterior fontanelles, 12 to 18 months. Not sooner than 12 months because that brain is still growing in there. So if it closes too early, again, that that's usually has to be corrected surgically. Okay. Um, going here. Here's the different variations. All right, so head size. Um, a newborn, big head, little body. So proportionately, we have a big head. As they get older, their head, they kind of grow into their head. Um, toddlers, a little bit more proportionate. As they get to be an adult, their head and their body are proportionate. Therefore, um, head injuries are fairly common in little ones because they fall over because their heads are so big. So just kind of keep that in the back of your brain. Some different types that we're going to talk about of neurological disorders. We're going to talk about some structural disorders, um, seizure disorders. That's a big part of neuroinfectious disorder, disorders, trauma. Um, and then blood flow and chronic disorders, we'll touch on a couple, um, but we'll spend more time on the first four there. Alrighty. Now, over in the chapter, they have, they have the nursing process, which I love this, this box, um, and it's got all of the, the um, assessment um, information in it, what you need to assess. But then right in the middle of it, it's got some common medical treatments. So um, we'll come back to these. Let's talk about some common types of structural defects. Um, structural defects, craniosynostosis, we talked about that. It's when the sutures close too early, surgically corrected. Um, neural tube defects, unfortunately, these happen early on in pregnancy, usually. Um, so they can cause some structural defects. Microcephaly. Um, We'll get to this in the text. We'll touch on it just briefly. There's a picture in there what microcephaly looks like. Arnold Chiari, Chiari malformation, there's type 1 and type 2. Um, and they are not too common in kids. A lot of times they go undetected. Nobody knows that, um, that patients have these, and they're just kind of a secondary finding if they happen to do a CT scan of the head. Um, hydrocephalus. We're going to spend some time on hydrocephalus because it's fairly common. Um, well, I say fairly common. None of these disorders are, are really, really, really common, but as a neuro defect goes, it's fairly common. It's where you have fluid build up on the brain and you have to um, drain that fluid somehow. So hydrocephalus sometimes requires, or most of the time requires, placement of a what's called a VP shunt, ventriculoperitoneal shunt. Um, goes from the ventricles in the brain all the way down into the peritoneum, and it 
maintains the um, normal level of fluid in the brain. All right, so again, here's some um, assessment things that you might be looking for um, when you're talking to a parent about a neuro defect and kind of correlates with the health history over here. You want to ask about the following things, nausea, vomiting, and changes in gait, changes in level of consciousness. Infants, they're very hard to assess for neuro things because they can't tell you, oh, my head hurts, oh, I see double. Um, you might have vomiting, you might have poor feeding, you might have just fussiness. Uh, a fussy infant is worrisome because you don't know, you can't really pinpoint what's going on with them. All right, here's some so common signs again, just um, ir increased irritability, big, big, big in infants. Um, if patients come in and say they are, are all of a sudden have blurry vision or double vision, then that could be a red flag. And um, changes in gait, if they start falling down, if they get clumsy, that could be something that you need to investigate. All right, some common treatments. Okay, let's go over the, the lab test first and then we'll talk about treatments. All right, so if you suspect um, or if someone suspects something infectious going on with your patient, a lot of times you'll do a lumbar puncture um, or a spinal tap. Um, lumbar puncture collects CSF, they send it to the lab, they do gram stains, they do bacterial um, plates, so they check for bacteria, they can check for viruses, they can check for fungus um, with a lumbar puncture. If an infant comes into the emergency department or presents to the office with a fever, um, a neonate, I'm sorry, let's, let's go back, a neonate, so less than 30 days old, they're always, almost, almost always going to get a lumbar puncture because the blood-brain barrier is not fully functional at that age and anything that's introduced into this, the bloodstream can pass through that and they're looking for meningitis. Um, intracranial pressure measurements, um, sometimes you have a, a device that measures the pressure in the brain um, externally. Um, we used to call these a bolt. I don't know if they're still called a bolt. haven't seen one in a long time. Uh, thank goodness. But um, that measures the pressure in the brain. EEGs, looking for seizures. Um, head and neck x-rays. Um, skull fractures, cervical vertebrae fractures, that's what you're looking for there. Ultrasound, um, ultrasounds, let's see, ultrasound with neuro. I'll come back to that. Um, CT, you see a lot of CTs, especially with head injuries, with headaches sometimes. Um, CTs can find brain tumors, they can find bleeds, um, see a lot of CTs with the neuro or with the neuro situation. MRIs, um, MRIs can look for um, structural, structural things. Um, MRI is usually done after a CT. CT is the quick and dirty. Um, unfortunately, it is a lot of radiation, so we try to limit our CTs. If we don't have to do a CT, then we try not to. All right, some treatments that you might see with a neuro disorder. Um, shunt placement. We talked about hydrocephalus. Shunt placement um, reduces the in intracranial pressure um, because it drains the fluid. It normalizes the fluid level. This is a great table over here that talks about what you need to assess if you have a shunt. So I would um, pay special attention to that. Uh, ventilation. You're in... Um, critical care right now, so you know all about the ventilators, right? Um, so there's some um, increased indications for ventilation, increased intracranial pressure, what you want to monitor, important. PT, OT, speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Uh, once a child is diagnosed with a neurological disorder, um, like a head injury or um, head trauma, 
meningitis, you can have residual effects from meningitis, then they might need PTOT speech therapy. An EVD, external, external ventricular drain, um, if we need to reduce um, intracranial pressure, but not permanently. So there's a catheter that they place into the ventricle and it drains to the, ex, it drains to the outside. Um, I've seen a couple of these up on the floor when we had when I had students up there. Um, really intricate. You have to make sure that the level of the drain maintains not too high, not too low of a CSF pressure. So um, these kids are usually not up and down out of bed. Um, that drain is is marked where you need to keep it level. Um, Kind of an intricate process to manage. All right, um, some things that might help with seizures: the vagal nerve stimul, vagal nerve stimulator, and the ketogenic diet. Um, both of those are used in kids that have seizures. All right, some medications that you might see um, can with a, a neuro disorder: antibiotics. If you um, have a bacterial meningitis then you will definitely be getting some antibiotics for that. Um, Anti-seizure meds, you'll see a lot of these. There are some pretty common ones, and we'll, there's a chart in the book that talks about the most common ones, and we'll look at those. Um, analgesics, um, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, morphine, all of those for, for pain, for headaches. You don't give kids aspirin for pain, so remember that. And then osmotic diuretics um, to decrease intracranial or increase to decrease increased intracranial pressure. Um, use mannitol is one that they use. And then if you have a spinal cord injury or any anything that's going on inflammatory, um, you may see some IV steroids used. All right, so all of that little box was right in the middle of the whole assessment process. So here's what you're going to look for in a physical assessment if you have a suspected neurological disorder. Let's catch up on our slides here. Okay, I'm gonna All right, um, level of consciousness. That's the biggie. Any change in level of consciousness? If you have a child that has had a head injury and they all of a sudden are very uptunded, then um, that should pique your interest. And there's the things that you want to observe, their vital signs, their cranial nerve function, and there's a nice chart about cranial nerve function in here, and their motor function, their reflexes. Um, all of those are important to assess in a neuro assessment. Now you guys had your V-SIM and your, your seizure um, patient, so you kind of know, you know, you, you walk through care of a patient that has had a seizure. Um, it was hard, I know, to get all of that assessment in before he did start seizing. So you can just read through this, kind of slow it down in your brain, and this is what we should assess if we have a patient that we have some sort of neurological um, complaint. These four levels of consciousness, um, I would, or I'm sorry, five, I would know the difference between them um, and how they progress, okay? The Glasgow Coma Scale. Now I put, the pediatric one is in here. I put just a regular one, I think, um, in the course. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, pediatric or the Glasgow Coma Scale. Your minimum score that you can get on this is 30. Um, you get a three just for showing up, okay? So a zero is not possible. Remember that when you are charting, okay? 15 is the best. Um, three is the worst. All right, and you can, you can see kind of how you score your patient. All right, so you some embarrassment there. Um, head, face, and neck, observe for trauma. Observe for shape. Um, you might have a child that has oh, plagiocephaly. We'll, we'll see some pictures of that here in a second. Um, 
but you want to make sure that you assess all the fontanelles and the different sutures, um, especially during well child checks. Um, the age, the prime age to correct any kind of plagiocephaly or cranio, or plagiocephaly is um, when they're young, when that skull is still very moldable, and they usually fix that with a helmet. Um, and I've got some cute helmet pictures I'll show you in a second. Um, but important to note that on um, the growth charts as well, head circumference. All right, back to the left. Some prenatal risk factors for neurological disorders. Prematurity. Um, ba premature babies have very friable capillaries and veins and arteries in their brain, so they're more prone to brain bleeds. Um, if mom was an alcohol or drug user, um, infection during pregnancy, and sometimes, unfortunately, mom can't help it. Um, she's exposed to something that um, can be harmful to the, the fetus, and she doesn't even know it. So, it's sad cases. Um, risk factors for birth trauma, if they're big, if they're preemie, and if they have a big head. Uh, and if they have any sort of congenital anomaly, anomalies like um, microcephaly. All right, so let's get down to seizures real quick. Okay, I'm going to let you look through the cranial nerves and what you need to assess um, for the cranial nerves. Oh, let's talk about doll's eyes real quick. The doll's eyes, man doll's eyes maneuver, you always want a positive doll's eye, okay? Because if you look... What the doll's eye is, is if you turn your head to the right, your eyes should go to the left to normalize your gaze. Um, if they don't, that's a negative doll's eye and that's bad. Okay, sun setting of the eyes, bad. Okay, remember that. Fixed and dilated pupils, bad. Uh, posturing, before we get to seizures, posturing. Decorticate is where, and I think there's pictures, there are. Decorticate is where everything comes in towards the cord. The cerebrate is the is the worst. Okay, so decorticate is bad. The cerebrate is worse. All right, here this is an important chart. Early signs and late signs of increased intracranial pressure. Um, with an infant, you always want to assess that thought now because if it's bulging, say your baby's sitting up and you're assessing the thought now that anterior um, yeah anterior fontanelle and it's bulging that means increased intracranial pressure okay if it's sunken side note if it's sunken that could mean that your baby's dehydrated all right and then this just goes over some more assessment um, techniques sorry this doesn't really line up with the powerpoint again um, we're going to come back to this chart This is the, per, the, the holding position for an infant for a lumbar puncture. And then, um, okay for an adult, but a lot of times they'll have them sit up on the side of the bed too. All right, seizures. Different types of seizures, okay? You probably, in your head, you think of a seizure when you think of a seizure, you think of a tonic-clonic seizure. Uh, but there are many different kinds. There's probably even more than this. Um, absence seizures. Patients can have absence seizures, gosh, hundreds of times a day. And you don't, they're not even noticed. Um, I think that I heard one case scenario described as this patient had like 600 a day. But nobody even knew because it was just like two or three seconds, they'd space out, and then they're right back. Um, so those types of seizures, a lot of times undiagnosed. All right. Um, Tonic-clonic is the classic what you what you think of a seizure. They tighten up and they shake. Okay. Um, atonic, atonic seizures, here's the chart that describes all those. Atonic seizures are kind of like drop seizures. You'll be walking along, and all of a sudden, patient will just fall down. Um, that's a pretty dramatic one. Tonic-clonic grand mal is what we used to call them, but that's the most common seizure. 
in the most dramatic. Um, absence seizures, here you go, it was a description about, um, about absence seizures. And then infantile spasms, they look like seizures, um, but they're seen very early on. Um, they present a little bit different, and then there may be some other um, things that you see after it. Sometimes that's the first sign that there's something else going on. All right. Status epi epilepticus. I don't know why I can't speak today. Sorry about that. Um, it's when you have a seizure that lasts and lasts and lasts and lasts. Anything that lasts more than five minutes, um, that's a 911 call. Okay. If a patient has seizures and they don't last more than five minutes, that's just part of their seizure. Um, that's just part of their disorder. Um, parents are taught to medicate if they last more than five minutes. Now, something else I want to talk about is febrile seizures. Um, febrile seizures are fairly common in the under five age. Um, it happens when, and there's a good explanation of it here in the text in a second, it happens when temperature goes up too fast or goes down too fast. Um, really important to teach parents not to, if, they, or if their baby has a high fever, don't dunk them down in the ice water, guys, okay? Um, cool them off gradually. Undress them. Give them Tylenol or Motrin. That's the way you, you cool them down. Motrin only if they're six months or greater. Um, if the temperature, there's not really a lot we can do about temperature going up too fast, and unfortunately sometimes kids just have febrile seizure when that happens. Um, but if they have a febrile seizure, they usually bring them to the emergency department or to the doctor's office, uh, usually to the emergency department. And then you can do some teaching, okay? You can say monitor, you know, if you start, if you feel your child starting to get warm, let's go ahead and pre-medicate, therefore our our temperature won't spike up quickly. Um, and all seizures are, to back up, all seizures are just kind of a miscommunication with the electrical impulses in the brain. So um, when you have that big fever that disrupts that electrical circuit and it causes the child to have a seizure, they don't mean that your child is going to be epileptic later on in life. Um, they usually outgrow them by about five or six. And once you've had one, it's pretty common to have more than one. So lots of teaching with febrile seizures. Okay, Parents are scared to death, as I would be if my child had a seizure with fever. Um, some things that might cause, um, well, let's come back to that. Let's talk about meds with seizures. And there are some common ones, like I said. Dilantin. Dilantin is probably the oldest. And... Um, the most common. Phosphenatoin we is kind of a, a new and improved, it's kind of the Zopinex of albuterol. Um, it's kind of the new and improved Dilantin. Phenobarb, Phenobarbital, again an old medication but very um, effective. Um, what are some other popular ones here? Depakote is used pretty frequently. Um, Tegretol, is used pretty frequently. Um, Lamictal, that's this one down here. These are the generic names. Um, so Lamictal is used pretty frequently. So here are the things that you need to watch um, or you need to monitor if your patient is on any of these medications. All right, um, if your child has a seizure, some lab tests might be done to rule out what caused the seizure. Um, electrolytes, because if your sodium gets too low, you can seize. If your sodium gets too high, you can seize. CT might be um, in order to look for any tumors or anything or bleeds like that. Um, EEG will probably be scheduled outpatient. They don't usually do emergent EEGs. Um, skull x-ray, if there's a fracture or a trauma causing a bleed that causes seizures then that might be in order. So those are some things that, usually first time seizures, you'll have a really good workup there. Seizure precautions, if you have a patient seizing, these are the things that you wanna do, okay? Um, I know in the DSIM it just said, 
put seizure precautions in place, but if you delve a little deeper, you can see what they are. Um, pat in the rails, have suction at bedside. Um, you know, if they're a seizure patient, if it's more than one seizure, they should wear some sort of medical alert thing to let people know that, um, and I say thing now because there's bracelets, there's rings, there's necklaces, there's everything. So, um, somebody should know that they are a seizure patient. All right, um, teaching guidelines for your parents. This is what you need to teach. Call EMS if it lasts more than five minutes, okay? Or if it's the kid's first seizure. And you can't really teach them about febrile seizures beforehand because, you know, they're pretty unpredictable. Um, but you most always get the child to the emergency department after they have their first seizure, even if it's a febrile seizure. All right, I'm going to let you read through this. This does talk about febrile seizures, and it just says everything that we just talked about. Okay. Moving right along to structural defects. Um, catch up over here. All right, so neural tube defects we talked about, birth defects. Unfortunately, a lot of times those are unpreventable. unpreventable. Um, they might be found on an ultrasound, um, just as an incidental finding, not suspecting anything. And when mom has her ultrasound, then they identify that the patient has anencephaly or um, microcephaly. It's very sad. I'm gonna let you read through that. You don't. We don't really see. That's not very common. Um, Chiari malformation, I'm going to let you read through that information on your own. Here's some more information about hydrocephalus. It does talk about therapeutic management, and here's our shunt. So the shunt goes in the ventri ventricles, drains down to the belly, to the peritoneum. Now, they used to measure from up here down to here and put that much tubing in. And when the child grew, they'd have to go in and do a shunt revision to lengthen the tubing. Well, somebody got smart, and now they coil all of that extra tubing up, and as the child grows, then that tubing stretches out, and they have to do less shunt revisions. So that was a, a good move, less exposure to surgical procedure. Okay, here are some things that you need to assess when you have a child with um, the shunt, with hydrocephalus. Okay. Again, here are some assessment findings, but in an infant, they're going to be very vague symptoms. They're going to be irritable. They're going to feed, feed poorly. Um, you might have some vomiting. Okay, so hard to tell in the little ones. All right. This talks about an EVD, um, what I said earlier about the external ventricular drain. You need to keep it very steady because rapid drainage can cause big time headache. Um, it can actually even cause um, like, um, sorry about that. It can actually even cause um, subdural hematomas, um, ne uh, neurological deterioration. It can be bad. So make sure you keep it level. Make sure you keep it at the, the level that's marked on the drain. That's what that talks about. All right, we're going to skip through this. Okay, craniosynostosis. Craniosynostosis is when those sutures close prematurely, and um, usually it's these sutures right here. I don't know if you can see my little uh, yellow dot, but these, these sutures right here close prematurely, and they have to go in and they create a zigzag um, cut in the skull and open that back up and allow it to close again normally. So um, we had a little patient one time that had craniosynostosis and he had a nice little zigzag scar right over his, from ear to ear. Of course his hair covered it, but, and he was fine. All right, plagiocephaly. Plagiocephaly, you hear about the back to sleep um, to prevent SIDS, but it also, that since that skull is so moldable, sometimes it can cause some flattening 
in the back of the head, okay? And I think the book has a picture. Yeah. So there's some pictures of some um, some of the Sethleys. Now, this is, this is such an ugly helmet. I have such a better helmet picture. I'm going to show you here. Hold on one second. Isn't that a cuter helmet picture? That's my little friend. She had um, she had plagiocephaly. She wore her little helmet um, for as long as she needed to. She wore it about mm, six months, and now she has a beautiful head. So that's a much better helmet picture. Get on the stuff back in here. All right. Sometimes this this is a two step process. They do one helmet. And then they go back in and they take measurements and they shave off a little bit of the inside and take more measurements. Then they let them rest for a week or two. And then they go and do another helmet. So most of the time it's a two-step process, um, sometimes even three. Uh, but you can see how the flat, the back of that child's head is a little bit flat. And since it is so moldable, it's so fixable. All right, so now let's talk about some infectious disorders. Bacterial meningitis, catch up my slides here. I think I'm trying to go too fast. I'm trying to keep it under 30 minutes. All right, so let's just stick with the chapter. Bacterial meningitis, um, signs and symptoms of bacterial meningitis. There you go. Um, sudden onset of symptoms, fever, sometimes you have a rash uh, that won't blanch, um, purple rash, uh, purpura, petechiae, um, stiff neck. Now, a stiff neck, patients come in sometimes and they say, oh, my neck hurts, my neck hurts. But when you're assessing a child with bacterial meningitis, it is truly a stiff neck. We had one came in one time and... Um, she was laying on the cot. She came into the primary care doctor's office when I was a nurse practitioner. And when you lifted up her head, she was sick. I mean, you could tell she was very sick. And when you lifted up her head, her whole upper body came up off the table. So that's true, what we call nuchal rigidity, uh, not just my neck hurts when I move it. Okay. These are all symptoms that you look for, or I'm sorry, signs and symptoms that you look for when you're assessing for um, anything infectious. Never seen a kiddo do that. I can tell you that. All right, this uh, this little box up here talks about the rash, an abrupt eruption of a petechial or purplish, which is called purpura rash, that can be in um, indicative of meningococcemia. Okay, that's the bad stuff. So if you have big purple blotches, that's the bad stuff. Now the bottom picture here. Um, She's testing for nuchal rigidity, and that patient can move their neck, it looks like. So that's kind of how we test for it. When this little girl came in, when we lifted up her head, her whole body came up. So it was bad news. And then here's how we diagnose this. They diagnose it, get a little bit of blood, maybe some urine, but definitely a lumbar puncture. I'm going to let you read through aseptic meningitis. Don't see that very often. All right, so the main thing I want you to take away from with um, infectious process is your assessment findings. What are you looking for? Okay, um, you're looking for fever. You're looking for change in level of consciousness. You're looking for irritability, poor feeding, vomiting, photophobia. Those are all important to look for in um, an infectious process. Rye syndrome, we talk about no aspirin in kids. This is why. Um, it is a, a neuro illness. There are the signs and symptoms of it, and it's caused by um, ingesting aspirin when you have a viral illness. So if you've got a virus, say you have a headache with your virus, mom gives me some aspirin, that could be um, perfect storm for Rye syndrome. Things that have aspirin in them that parents don't know, Pepto-Bismol, it says Alka-Seltzer has aspirin in it, I didn't realize that, uh, but Pepto-Bismol is the big, the big offender. Um, 
parents don't know. They don't know that it's got aspirin in it. So good teaching if, if patient comes in with um, sick stomach and mom says, oh, I gave him some Pepto-Bismol. Do some teaching right then. There we go. All right, so let's talk about head trauma. I think we've caught up to our slide now. Head trauma. See a lot of head trauma in kids, okay? The non-accidental non -accident, head trauma is very unfortunate. Um, we see a lot of concussions. We see a lot of skull fractures. We see, unfortunately, a few... Um, bleeds from non-accidental and accidental head trauma. So just kind of an um, outline of what you might see, some common head trauma. Skull fractures, you can have just a linear skull fracture, a depressed skull fracture is where the bone is actually pressing down into the brain. Um, basilar skull fracture, you're going to assess for the battle sign, which is the bleed or bruising behind the ear, and that's a pretty common finding in basilar skull fractures. Concussion, contusion, those are what you're going to see the most of. Okay, Concussion syndromes. Now concussions, I used to think of concussions as, eh, you know, just a concussion. Um, but concussions can be bad news. They can have long-standing effects from a concussion. So if you have a patient and they're just diagnosed with a concussion, do some, do some good teaching. Okay, um, If patient gets worse if they start vomiting, if they have vision changes, of course if they have seizures or if you can't wake them up then they need to come back ASAP. Um, I wouldn't take this lightly, okay, so do some good teaching with concussions. Now, this talks about the different kinds of subdural and epidural hematoma. I would know the difference. Um, this is kind of a no-brainer. Healthy People 2020, we want to reduce the fatal and non-fatal traumatic brain injuries. And that is a um, fabulous goal to have. Um, unfortunately, sports, lots of head injuries in sports. You hear about them recently. Um, there is a good, I need to get some more information on the, uh, the football, um, what am I trying to say? the football initiative to reduce the number of concussions. So I'll see if I can get some information on that and post it. Um, it's the state of Texas, I think, doing like a big initiative on educating coaches and players about what a concussion looks like. You know, they've instituted the concussion protocol in all the major sports, so um, they're looking at it. All right, um, here's some teaching guidelines. Send mom and dad home with this kind of information. Um, well, that'll be, you probably will see a lot of teaching, a lot of these teaching guidelines, um, boxes again, sometime soon, hint, hint. All right, so let me see what else we need to focus on. I know I'm at 38 minutes, so, um, non-accidental head trauma, unfortunately it does happen. Um, you need to do a really good assessment of the situation. And if anything sticks out to you that doesn't make sense or that doesn't line up with the patient's story and the patient's assessment, then you need to investigate that. Risk factors um, associated with the shaken baby syndrome. We'll talk about this more later on in the, in the course about when we talk about child abuse. But single parents, um, preemies, infants or kids that have chronic medical disorders and those are all kind of uh, risk factors for shaken baby syndrome. Young parents, um, substance abuse parents, um, birth trauma, near drowning, I'm going to let you read through those. Um, I do, I would like you to know some teaching guidelines to prevent um, drowning, water safety. Talked about that, I think, in the toddler podcast. All right, stroke in a pediatric patient. Not real common, but 
You might see a stroke with um, sickle cell patients, okay? That's one of the things you want to make sure that you assess their neuro status very good. Um, meningitis, if you um, have a lot of fluid buildup or blood buildup on the brain, then you could have um, a stroke in a patient. Um, again, you don't see this very often in a pediatric patient. Chronic disorder, you do see a lot of migraines, especially in the teenage years. Uh, I don't know if they're hormonal, they could be, um, but headaches are a whole new workup, okay? Uh, you want to monitor headaches pretty, pretty closely. Keep a headache diary is a good idea. Um, don't let parents or patients get behind the pain. If you feel a migraine coming on, try to, you know, do whatever your protocol is to, um, to alleviate it before it gets to the point where it's a 10. Um, there are some things that trigger migraines or trigger headaches. Um, some people smell somebody's perfume and it triggers a headache. Uh, weather, of course, the barometric, barometric pressure um, can cause headaches. Uh, foods, MSG containing foods, chocolate, caffeine. Now, caffeine is interesting with headaches. You, it can either cause you to have a headache or it can make your headache better. And that's what they used to treat migraines with is caffeine. So um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. All right, and here's our care plan. Um, I would read through this pretty closely. It kind of touches on every area, the structural, the seizure, the infectious, the trauma. Um, touches on all of those areas. All right, I want to go back to the slides and make sure that there's nothing that we missed there. I'm going to stop right there. Okay, let's see. Um, here are some signs and symptoms of an acute stroke in children, and guess what? It's pretty much the same as an adult, okay? One-sided weakness or facial droop, slurred speech, course changes in level of consciousness, um, and uh, if they have difficulty walking, all important to assess. Uh, we talked about those. There was one up here that I wanted to talk about. Signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. I think we've already discussed all of these. All right, when you're looking for a child with increased intracranial pressure, um, these are some of the things that you want to assess. Again, we talked about how infants differ from bigger kids that can tell us I have a headache. Um, reflexes, motor function. You can do kind of across the room assessment. When you come into a room, um, just kind of look at the child and see what their level of consciousness is. If they're super irritable or if they're super obtunded, um, then of course you need to investigate further. That makes sense. Um, Vital signs, you need to make sure you take a full set of vital signs, okay? Um, do a good, thorough health history about vomiting, um, difficulty walking, balance issues. This is going to be where a child's normal. Um, if you are their medical home, this is going to be important um, to know what their normals are so that you'll know their abnormals um, if you see them. All right, I think we've covered everything on this side. Um, so, to recap, structural issues, seizure disorders, infectious disorders, bacterial meningitis, um, trauma, head trauma, know what to assess, know what to do about them, know what to teach parents about them, okay? Um, and I think that's about it. Y'all have a good afternoon.